We are live. Welcome everyone to Connected Learning TV. Uh, this is the fourth and final webinar of our October 2015 series titled Doing Innovation, Empowering Young People for Tomorrow's World. If you're watching this, uh, please take a moment to share it with your networks. Um, I'm Craig Watkins, a University of Texas professor, um, and I do research on innovation, technology, and I've just launched a new project called doinginnovation.org. Sorry about that. And I'll be your host for much of the webinar uh, this, uh, for the webinar this month, actually, the series that we've been doing. Uh, throughout this series on Connected Learning TV, we've explored the landscape of the new economy and considered what kinds of skills and resources young people need as they seek to build more robust pathways to opportunity. We know we live in a changing world, a changing economy, uh, and we hope that this might be uh, a sort of nice sort of bookend to a series of conversations that we've had prior uh, this month just looking at how the world of technology, innovation, and opportunity are rapidly evolving. Um, today we have a really um, uh, awesome uh, sort of, uh, set of guests here with us today. They're going to introduce themselves momentarily, um, and so I'll, I'll, um, I'll let them do that. Uh, again, our goal here today is to talk about the, the changing nature of, of schools and education, uh, tech leadership, and also policy as it relates to building more diverse uh, innovation economies. Before we get into the chat, uh, let's go over just a few quick details. And to those who are watching live right now, uh, we welcome your comments and questions through either the Twitter hashtag, a hashtag Connected Learning, or the question and answer feature that you'll see within the video player. We'll do our best to address any questions that you might have here in the, in the Google Hangout, so please feel free to send those to us uh, as they might arise. This webinar is also being co-streamed at the National Writing Projects, educatorinnovator.org. Um, and uh, so before we begin, I'd like to ask uh, each of our uh, panel members uh, to introduce themselves. Uh, Sherry, would you like to start us off? You're on mute. Sherry, I think you're on mute. Yes, Sherry Greenberg. Happy to be here. Thank you, Craig. I'm a clinical professor at the LBJ of Public Affairs at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, where I do um, research and work with students and projects on uh, technology and governance and um, economic development in urban areas, uh, including issues such as workforce and housing affordability. Um, I'm also on the board of Central Health here in Austin, our local um, entity that does health care uh, for those below 200 percent of federal poverty, mainly, and um, do some other things in the community. So happy to be here. Thank you. Joe? Sure, I'm Joe Strabar. I'm a professor at, in the radio TV film department at UT and I've been working probably for like the 17 years since I got to Austin on digital inclusion, particularly on the east side, looking particularly at the role of, role of schools but public access, particularly libraries, and how we can kind of help bring both better access but also better learning about how to use access. So I see broadband as a key issue but also see as a very important question where people learn to use the access they have. And I'm pretty interested in looking at um, some of the background issues like how Austin's history of segregation has kind of brought us to some of the difficulties we presently have. Great. Mark? Hi, my name is Mark Strama. I am uh, well, like Sherry, I served five sessions in the Texas legislature before um, leaving there to come here. I work at Google Fiber. Uh, I'm the city manager for Google Fiber in Austin, leading the deployment of our network throughout the city. Um, and as, as folks here in Austin know, we've been doing a lot of work on the issue of digital inclusion. I'm filling in today for my colleague, Parissa Fatehi Weeks, who uh, had an unexpected uh, event come up that she couldn't be here. I have a. I have to apologize in advance that I can only stay for the first 20 minutes or so because um, I. This was a last minute fill in for me, but I'm glad I could join y'all for a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and again, Mark, uh, thank you so much for hopping in. And uh, you are uh, wonderful and, and uh, certainly timely replacement uh, for Parisa. So uh, thank you again for doing that. So maybe Mark, we'll we'll start with you. Uh, so we, we kind of anticipated this conversation um, really uh, kind of revolving around a few themes. 
uh, sort of this recognition that we live in a sort of rapidly evolving economy, uh, as we know here in Austin, a sort of thriving, robust innovation economy. Uh, and, and so one of the, the, the major themes that we wanted to address in this webinar is this issue of sort of inclusion, this issue of equity. And I know these have been sort of front and center issues for you at Google Fiber. Maybe you could talk a little bit about sort of strategically some of the initiatives that Google Fiber has taken to help really build opportunities for a more connected world. I'd, I'd love to. Uh, I'm, I gotta say first of all that I wish it were Parissa here to talk about this because she's just done extraordinary work and the, the work that I think she's most proud of and that I'm most proud of is the work we've been doing with the Housing Authority of the City of Austin. And I should say about that work that they were doing that work before we came along. The, the Housing Authority of Austin is, has been a thought leader on this in the public housing community for a long time. Um, when we held our first meeting for multifamily property owners here in Austin, the first people through the door of that meeting, and we were, you know, that meeting was for uh, folks who own, you know, large condominiums and apartment complexes all over the city, but the first people in to, talk, to find out how to get Google Fiber to their property were the folks from Hakka. Um, they, working with Parissa, they have developed a plan to put a free Google Fiber internet connection, not the gigabit speed that is our our high-end product uh, for for the market, but we have a basic broadband product that's five megs down, one meg up that we're providing in the housing authority properties for zero dollars per month, and um, that's a that's a tremendous opportunity for folks to access the internet, even folks now. Haka, with some support from us and with support from a lot of other stakeholders in the community, including Austin Community College, which has made a big contribution to this effort, and many others. Uh, Haka is addressing not just the connect the connectivity obstacle that causes the digital divide, but also the device obstacle and the digital literacy obstacle through partnerships with nonprofits such as Austin Freenet and. That, that holistic approach has attracted the national attention from the House, Department of Housing and Urban Development and from the White House and has been sort of the, is sort of the, uh, the model for what HUD wants to roll out nationally with its recently announced Connected Home initiative. No, that's interesting. Um, you know, Joe, I know you've, you've been on sort of the, the front lines of a lot of this research, um, sort of using Austin as a sort of a laboratory to explore issues of inclusion, digital inclusion. Um, and you've done a lot of work with, for example, one of the organizations in Austin Freenet that Mark just mentioned. Um, I don't know if you have any, any initial sort of responses or reactions to, uh, to Mark's observations about some of the initiatives that Google Fiber is taking, but well, kind of what's your perspective on and where we are in terms of, of digital, digital inclusion efforts, this idea of building a more dig digitally literate world, a more connected world, a more inclusive world? No, in fact, it's, you know, I'm also, Dr. Wenhong Chen and I are actually doing the evaluation of the Hakka project that Mark's talking about with Google Fiber, Austin Freenet, uh, Austin Community College, etc. In fact, we're literally just today finalizing our initial report. So a couple of the things that, so let me talk a little bit about that really briefly, that it seems the, the connectivity, of course, rolls out a bit slowly because, you know, it takes time to wire up the city. And so in some ways, the training effort and the giving people device part has gotten out in front of the, the connectivity a bit, but the training's been very effective. We've been looking at that kind of before and after, and we don't really have the whole before and after piece statistically worked out because we're still collecting um, some of the what happens after people have the free net training. But from qualitative interviews we've done, from observation we've done, it looks like that's really fantastically effective. So I think Mark really hit the nail on the head that in many ways what you need is not only connectivity, and connectivity, I would say, at home and nearby. One of the things that stands out in the survey is that uh, Hakka residents are big users of public access, both in the libraries and in Hakka's own community centers. And from earlier stuff we've done with a city survey with the Austin, in fact, two city surveys, one thing that stands out is that people need broadband at home, but they also need some place to go to learn how. I mean, I've been 
working on a, a couple of papers, and one of them is digital inclusion one crisis at a time, that people tend to run into something that they have to do. They have to apply to the city for benefits. They have to create a resume and post it online for a job. And by and large, they don't know enough to know how to do that on their own, even if they have broadband. So they go to the library or go to some place to learn how to do that. So I think one of the things I'm looking at is kind of a biggish hole in our process is once we get the connectivity to people, either getting out the kind of training that Freenet's doing or the kind of crisis training on demand that a couple of libraries and say the DeWitty Center does. Uh, if I may, I say something about that real quick. Um, we're here talking to a bunch of people on a video conference, right? Which means we're talking to an incredibly digitally sophisticated audience right now. Which makes me feel impelled to, without hopefully sounding pedantic, to say, uh, to to say something I often say to the to the Googlers that I work with, for whom the notion that uh, access to the internet, that one of the obstacles to overcoming the digital divide is convincing people of the relevance of accessing the internet. That, to this audience, I'm just guessing, might not ring very true because y'all are so internet savvy that you're watching a video chat right now, an on-air hangout. And and I have the, the I have the same experience when I talk to people in the tech industry. It's just they, it, this this notion of relevance being an obstacle to overcoming the digital divide is hard for many people to wrap their hands around. I've never heard this expression that you just used. Of uh, what was the expression you say? I I've observed that it's from it's a it's an exigent force. It, there has to be a forcing function, and it's usually a, a, a an urgent one that will compel someone to try the internet for the first time. You had a phrase for it that I've forgotten already. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 the idea, idea I'm saying, saying is that it's one crisis, crisis at a time. Yeah, right. Because It you know, is. I think that's right. And and the problem is, with I mean, obviously that's a problematic approach to digital literacy, right? Because you're not going to you're not going to get the thorough, uh, for, first of all, crises aren't the only use case for the internet for people who are currently not using the internet. It's just that 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 for we have to find a way both for those forcing functions to become an entry to a, a long runway that is a sustained engagement with the internet and also to get ahead of those forcing functions in some way to, to create relevance before they occur because because who knows how many times that crisis isn't addressed through, like there's not the means available to quickly solve for that forcing function and whatever crisis necessitated that internet access in the short term is worse than it should have been. The impact of it is magnified than what it would have been had that person facing that forcing function had digital literacy and a device and a connection prior to its existence. In fact, Mark, if I can speak to that for just a minute, I was just literally looking at the survey we've done of, of Haka users and non-users a sample of the whole Hakka population. It's the Housing Authority of the City of Austin, again, for those who aren't so used to that acronym. And the, the biggest single um, question is, well, relevance is one of the huge questions. In fact, the city's had a task force on this for about a year and a half now. And one of the conclusions we came up with in that task force after the first year was the need to demonstrate relevance to the last 8 to 10 percent of Austin that isn't already online. And in the, in the Hakka group, we've specifically found that a lot of people, the first biggest reason is they don't have anyone to teach them how to use it. The second is that they, a lot of them feel they have somebody like their grandchildren who will help them find what they need. Third is cost. Fourth is relevance. And fifth is disabilities. And so it's kind of interesting just to see how, because again, a lot of the people in the Hakka population have significant disabilities. And that's something I think that we're now struggling to work with. And I think once you look at the poorer population of Austin in general, a lot of those same factors kick in. Yeah, let me, and I know, um, I know Mark, you'll have to um, spin off here in a second, and, and Sherry, want to certainly get you in here as well. So I have a question from Mark that can also maybe be a good handoff or segue to, uh, to Sherry and some of her work around innovation districts, and then we can tie it back in, Joe, to some of the work that you've been doing on education and digital literacy. So Mark, as you sort of project forward in terms of, of, of the kinds of initiatives that Google Fiber will take, 
Um, one of the, the issues or one of the questions that we wanted to at least spotlight and address here in this webinar is, you know, how do we build more uh, diverse uh, forms of participation in our, in our innovation economy? Um, and I think certainly uh, some of the efforts that you're doing in terms of connectivity, uh, in terms of helping to build pathways to greater literacy and access and participation are really important. Um, just in terms of kind of internally, maybe conversations that you've been having there, conversations that you've had with other tech leaders, um, what, what do you see as the, as the primary pathways, right, to build a net more inclusive, that more diverse kind of tech and innovation economy? So this is, so the real answer to that may sound a bit like a commercial, and I'll try not to, but the real answer to that is make the cost of broadband for businesses cheaper. And we now have a small business product. Um, we didn't in Kansas City when we launched there four years ago, but when we launched in Austin, we had an offering for small businesses. And they are able from, if we, the, as Professor Strawberry observed, it takes us a, a while to build through the whole city, so we're not available to all small businesses in Austin yet. But, um, but for those who we are available, uh, we're offering, you know, they can get a gigabit for, for $100 a month. And that compares, and as we've always said about this business, we're also having the effect, even for people who don't sign up for Google Fiber Internet service, we're having, I think, the effect of bringing down the cost of Internet service and increasing the speed of Internet service from all providers in the market. And that seems like the, I think that's, there are a lot of ways to answer your question. It, there are a lot of different dimensions to how, how to create how to create uh, access to the efficiencies and revolutionary capabilities of technology for all businesses, for a diverse spectrum of businesses. My wife's a small business owner and operates a, an educational business, and uh, for her, the opportunity to have abundant internet access at a very affordable price is a meaningful opportunity for her to change, to transform her business. And, um, and so I think it starts there, and I think it can go a lot of different directions from there, um, which we're excited to watch unfold, frankly. And that, with, Sher with that, Sherry, I'd like to hand it off to you and excuse myself, but thank you guys for letting me join you. Absolutely. Thank you, Mark. Bye. So, Sherry, I, I think this is a good segue in, into you. I, I know you've been uh, thinking a lot about... Um, the rise of what some policy um, makers and, and city leaders and researchers refer to as innovation districts. Right. And, um, and I'm wondering if you, because I think that's, that, that development is a really important one to this conversation that, that I'd like for us to have. And really talking about sort of the design of innovation districts, what are they, what drives them, and then eventually here, how do we begin to, to sort of think about ways in which we can create more diverse pathways, entry points into these innovation economies to serve a broader segment of the community and to leverage right expertise that might exist beyond the sort of traditional corridors of power. So maybe you could open up by just telling us a little bit about innovation districts, what they are, what drives their growth, um, and uh, and how they might be relevant to this conversation that we're having here. Sure. So I spent uh, last year with a, a group of graduates since we did a research project class on uh, anchor institutions and innovation districts, specifically looking at who are the entities, and we, we picked Austin, who are the entities that anchor your community? And traditionally, we think of those as the eds and the beds, you know, the universities, the hospitals, but looking beyond that to businesses that could be anchors. So what's an anchor? An anchor would be a, a large entity. Maybe it is headquartered, maybe not, with sticky capital, but that participates in the community. And um, we also then wanted to look at could these entities who, who are anchors align their missions and that mission, including one that would include equity and opportunity uh, for all. And then looking at innovation districts around the country and some around the world to see how they form. So innovation district and, you know, we, we can look to Boston, we can look to St. Louis, we can look to Barcelona. Um, we looked at, I don't know, probably 50 and then uh, focused on eventually about 11 in our report. But there's no one definition, and they have formed in different ways. So it may be where uh, the, the state comes in 
um, and actually purchases a property. Um, it could be in St. Louis where Washington University was very involved. Um, in Boston you have one that sprung up more organically and another one that didn't. So there are different ways that they form but having, and this goes back to kind of if you look back in history, the industrial model, right, where you, and then we moved on to having kind of the office park and Texas and then getting into um, literature on the creative class and Brookings has a typology too looking at innovation districts but it's really looking at typically in urban areas but some of them are these tech office parts that are now converting where you have a, a not just a cluster of businesses and it doesn't have to be tech although many of them are around technology and um, some health and, and a lot of them with medical schools and universities but having this clustering either formally or informally and either with set boundaries or more iteratively as I've talked about the innovation district outside of a box right where it's not just set lines and you could even have a different part of the city that is involved um, think of it as kind of a, a a uh, clusters of innovation districts but one of the concerns that we had going into this and that I still have is if you take a city such as Austin where yes we're the fastest growing in the country and we've had um, enormous prosperity with this growth not everyone is sharing in the prosperity in fact we're very economically segregated so how can we have a situation whether it's when we're talking about um, broadband and digital inclusion which in itself is very interesting because there are some people who you would say digital divide what digital divide I'm young and mobile and perhaps Latino and that's how you get to me you go directly digital and mobile right? Uh, but then perhaps you talk to this individual's parents or grandmother or grandfather more likely and they're not part of it and what spurs them is it um, they want to communicate with the grandkids. That could be it. I need a job. I need training. So there can be that spur. But I also do want to point out that we have some, some young people who maybe grew up in households where they didn't have a TV. They didn't have a landline. They didn't have a laptop. But what do they have? They have that smartphone. So going directly digital and mobile. But it's really looking at how do we in a diverse way engage all of our community, engage them as far as public engagement to have a say in economic development, to have a say in an innovation zone and how could that help them as far as not just on um, innovation and technology but as far as entrepreneurs who may be their community has not been included in this ecosystem. Sherry, if I could help on and just add one thought to what you said because I, 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 you started with a really interesting phrase. I was just at a uh, conference for the Partnership for Progress on the Digital Divide and was talking to Nancy Kranich, the former head of the American Library Association. And she was talking about libraries and similar kind of technology centers as, as anchor institutions on the digital side for the community. So beyond eds and beds, we've also got, you know, the anchors of where people go to learn things and get access beyond the eds part because they don't learn everything they need in school. And they don't get all the chances that they need to learn things in school and so I think one yeah. of the thing one of the things to think about would be how to work places where people get not only access but help and and kind of not only and kind of training like the thing that Freenet's doing but also just responses in times of crisis you know because as Nancy was pointing out in an excellent paper when people have a crisis they tend to run to the public library and we need to sort of bring institutions like that into our thinking about opportunity and innovation how we extend that out to the people who may have a cell phone, may be trying to participate with it, but probably need help someplace. Right, and absolutely, and in fact when we looked at anchor institutions, we included um, not just universities, uh, but we included uh, nonprofits, foundations, public sector, the city of Austin, Austin Independent School District, as well as corporate, whether it's a, a potentially a Freescale or an HEB or a Whole Foods or Google. So we have a very robust anchor ecosystem that we speak of. And how would that then interact with what I'm calling this innovation ecosystem, the innovation district out of a box? And so looking at the intersection of those, and interesting that you brought up libraries because I was a couple of years ago at a conference outside of D.C. that was um, um, hosted um, and, and sponsored by a national grant looking at libraries 
library as no longer, and we're building a new library here in Austin, no longer as necessarily just a place or mainly a place to get books, but libraries as a focal point for the community, as learning centers, and there are many communities that we see around the country that they don't have the kind of co-working spaces that we have in Austin. They don't have um, the kind of digital opportunities we have in Austin, and so the library becomes a place, as it is for many still here in Austin, uh, where you can become connected, but where you can have a workspace, and where when we talk about economic development, where those who maybe have been left out of this prosperity, some of them who, because they don't have the training, and again, we get into digital divide can be a real lack as far as getting the training these people need so that they're no longer, as I say, flatlining in the service economy that can move up the ladder into some of these jobs that require, if they're not, they don't have to be in the tech sector, but technological skills. So also getting the training they need. I, I also happen to be now on the board of Austin Freenet, and this is very important um, that people have the training they need very often now just to apply to a job you have to apply online for instance yeah if if uh, if I could let me let me uh, pose a question that I'd like for you each to uh, to to take a turn considering um, so I think a big motivation for this webinar series is this this kind of recognition that we as as we all know here we live in a world in which our, our economy is changing rapidly, uh, the manner in which we participate in sort of civic life is changing rapidly, um, how our schools and centers of education and learning, maybe not changing as rapidly as we would like, but, but, but certainly, right, they are not the institutions uh, today that they were, were yesterday, at least in some respects. The point being here, right, is that, you know, we, we hear a lot, you know, about innovation, right? We live in a world of innovation, uh, from the president on down to various organizations and tech leaders, we're being told increasingly that we need to teach our kids innovation skills, right? That this is, that tomorrow's world is, is really uh, for those who can innovate, who can create new things, who can solve problems and respond to the challenges that we know all exist sort of on the horizon. And, and, and so we get that, I think, generally speaking, but, but it seems to me right that this notion of innovation and the way that we talk about it tends to be obligatory. And there, there, there are few, if any, real sort of credible or tangible pathways uh, that we might begin to consider and develop in terms of expanding opportunity uh, into this kind of innovation sector, this kind of innovation ecosystem. So I'm wondering, right, Sherry, from your, from your perspective in terms of policy, and Joe, from the work that you've done in terms of looking at schools and education uh, and, and, and the roles that education plays in terms of developing, right, uh, the next generation of, of, of talent, not only tech talent, but, but other forms of talent as well. And, and I guess the question here for each of you uh, to consider is, both from a policy perspective and also from an education perspective, what are we not doing that you would like to see us do in terms of really diversifying participation in our innovation economy, in terms of really opening up the doors of opportunity to a greater diversity of people to have impact, influence, uh, and uh, involvement in this sort of world of innovation uh, that we speak so much about. For me, I guess one of the things, if I could start that off, would be to figure out how to help people who are currently near the bottom of our economy find the scaffolding, you know, the, or the, the, the pathway up that they need to gain access skills and other things to kind of become those sort of small entrepreneurs. Like, you know, thinking of the point Sherry was making, I mean, several times now, observing in libraries as part of my research, I've literally watched some small business guy bring all of his books into the library and sit there on a 30-minute slot at an access terminal, try to do his books. And, you know, in a it's pointed out a couple of things that maybe if we want to take the idea of the innovation zone, we need to bring it down a couple of ladders, a couple of steps, because a guy like that isn't going to go to a co-working zone, even if it's even there's now a couple of them on Cesar Chavez, perhaps closer to where he lives. Somehow, I think we need to figure out how to stretch some of these concepts down below where they currently reside to, to get them closer to where somebody who's got you know is that dream in life would be to have a taco truck can begin to get some of the training about how to do entrepreneurship some of the skills on bookkeeping and and just getting a small business going all of those things and you know for instance one of the one of the standout places in Austin I've been impressed with it 
for 15, 20 years, 15, 17 years now, ever since I've looked at it, is the DeWitty Center at, at Freenet. It's probably one of the few places where somebody on a walk-in basis can go begin to get job training and then maybe on even into entrepreneurship. So I would love to see more places like that. I would love to see some elements of that come into public libraries and if possible into schools because we begin to lose a lot of kids to apathy literally in, in middle school. They don't even make it into high school. And if we could kind of have more after school programs, more partnerships, one that stands out to me, for instance, is, Aust is the River City Youth Foundation works, works with Mendez Middle School and the South East Branch Library. All of those things kind of working together to, along with Latinitas and some other institutions, to get kids more familiar with technology and more aware of what the possibilities in life are for them. Like River City has an amazing program called the Build Your, Fut Build Your Own Future Club, which starts with tech training and then gets them to set goals. And once they've set the goal, begins to get them to realize what education is required for that goal. And then begins to help them use the tech tools to explore all that. And so I think if we could get that kind of integrated scaffolding, you know, showing the relevance to people's futures and then beginning to help them realize what education is required, what skills are required to begin to build their way up. I mean, they're there just seems to be a gap between the way we typically think and talk about innovation, which still runs in circles that are already middle class or better, and how to sort of let that language, let those opportunities penetrate down to groups that aren't exposed to it and to get a better exposure, particularly into those kids' schools or other places where they might get on that ladder to climb up into that world. So. Um, I'm going to take a very broad view and then bring it back down as the response to that question. And my broad view is that I do not believe that we can look at workforce and the innovation economy being part of that in isolation. I'm doing work uh, this year, um, a, a, a research project on equitable access to quality of life. So what does that take? And if you talk about complete communities, I don't think we can isolate any of it. It means housing affordability, it means mobility, it means uh, wellness, um, workforce and education training, and public engagement and technology. So you have to have a hospitable, healthy, affordable place to live, right? And that starts with the children too. If there's lead, we know the repercussions. It would certainly be wonderful if this was located in an area where for, let's say, wellness, you could walk or bike or at least uh, have a, a bus route or if you need to drive that's fine but have also co-located your not just your uh, elementary schools and and um, whatnot but your um, clinics your workforce training centers this is why the libraries and the DeWitty centers and all of those are so important so I think we need to take a a holistic approach first to to quality of life if we're going to talk about opportunity and being able to enter into some of these new areas of the economy. And then if we if we drill down so to speak from there, we do need what we call in the in a, in the education um, community vertical integration. What the heck is that? That means aligning starting with preschool and grade school and all the way up through education and then into workforce training, whatever that may be, whether it's um, getting a certificate or going to an Austin Community College or a degree. Uh, but we, we do need um, an alignment uh, there with all of our education and um, training. But we need to do this in a way, as, as you were saying, that is exciting to young people and that is relevant. And I think when we look about at workforce training, we need to look at around the world. What are the best systems out there for workforce training, and and what are the component of those components? How do they do the education? How do they do the integration? Um, how do they scale up these training programs? How do they bring in the technology, and then find those models and deploy them at at scale here? Um, or in other communities because I think what we often see is we will find a really good program at a school or a library right or a DeWitty Center or 
a particular workforce training nonprofit, but they can maybe train a hundred people, right? And when we're talking about having lots of people who are not sharing in the prosperity, who are not being able to be part of this new economy, who are not, you know, they're not part of these co-working spaces and this kind of entrepreneurism, then we need to find out how we can, at a larger scale, um, have programs. Yeah, I think, um, you know, this is, these are some interesting observations. Um, now, a couple of reactions. Let me, let me maybe try, try one of them and, and maybe a second one can, can be integrated here uh, momentarily. Um, so with this, with this work that we've been doing over the last couple of years or so, my research team here in Austin, and this new project that we launched a couple of weeks ago called Doing Innovation, we were sort of struck by um, thinking about how millennials, for example, are sort of approaching this, this sort of precarious economy that they live in, um, you know, the sort of changing occupational structure here in society, um, whatever the impact of technology is on the nature and future of work and how they're, there are all of these different things they're grappling with, right, in, in terms of even college education and college degrees. What does that get you today uh, in a rapidly evolving economy? It doesn't get you today what it may have uh, produced 20 or 30 years ago. And so there are all of these different things that are going on, right? We know that millennials are the most educated generation in U.S. history, and yet, uh, you know, they're still significantly more likely to be unemployed or underemployed than previous generations of college graduates. And we know that the world is even, even, even tougher for young people who don't get to college or who don't graduate college with that degree in hand. And so we, we sort of ask a question, you know, so, so what do young people do in a world like this, right? And, and so we just immersed ourselves in, in these really interesting kind of what we call informal innovation ecosystems that are, are not a part of the sort of, you know, corridors of sort of traditional power that drive these sort of uh, more highly visible innovation ecosystems, but rather kind of operate on the edges and kind of the margins. And it's been interesting to see, you know, how young people are mobilizing kind of in those spaces and, and the kinds of resources that they're using, um, you know, how they're using smart technology in really smart ways, how they're actually using physical spaces, right, informal spaces, and not just uh, sort of your, your traditional kind of co-working space today, uh, but um, other kinds of venues, uh, you know, pubs, coffee shops, uh, late night spots, right, to do a lot of meeting up and hanging out, um, and the kind of, a lot of that kind of in, informal kind of professional development work and networking that's absolutely critical, right, to, to sort of finding these pathways to opportunity. And so, you know, as we think about, you know, the future of innovation and, and the, work, the work that we've been trying to do with doing innovation, right, it's just to maybe even redefine how we think about where innovation happens, redefine who the, the, the basis of innovation and who we associate with, with, with being innovative. And it's been interesting, right, to sort of look at it from that perspective and sort of thinking about, well, what are the resources that young people need? We think they need physical spaces to gather. Um, and, and so this idea of libraries, community centers, um, you know, co-working spaces, again, these sort of informal spaces uh, that can really serve, right, as a kind of catalyst, if you will, for doing all of the things that are traditionally associated with more thriving kind of innovation ecosystems, where ideas are exchanged, where people get to connect, where expertise and knowledge are shared and produced and cultivated, uh, and, and the ways in which young people are kind of informally sort of developing those same kinds of systems, those same kinds of spaces, uh, in ways that we may not necessarily understand or appreciate or even see, because they tend to be on, on the edges. And, and what we've kind of argued in this work, right, is that there's a lot that schools, for example, that educators and policymakers can learn from the kind of informal ways in which young people are doing innovation. And so I wonder, uh, you know, as we think about as we think about schools, as we, as we think about educational pathways, um, and we, you know, each of us sort of left here remaining on this on this on this call. We, I mean, we are affiliated with universities. We obviously, you know, believe heavily in the sort of education university model. But, but what can we be doing maybe, uh, you know, through education, K through 12, or even at the higher ed level, what can we be doing to maybe help accelerate uh, a greater diverse participation in this kind of innovation world that we're talking about here? So I'll start with that because, Craig, I think you've hit on something really important. When I said before, some people have skipped the digital divide, right? Um, just because uh, you may not be part of the formal economy or the the 
the kind of uh, elite that we think of um, involved in some of this or lower socioeconomic status. And that's when I talked about going directly digital and mobile, that we have young people, millennials, who may not have ever had any technology or even a, a landline phone or a TV in their home, but they have their uh, cell phone, their smartphone. And, and a lot of the millennials that you're talking about, they have that, and yes, they have their laptops too. But they are meeting informally. And um, many of us actually are doing that today. I have, I, I have um, several hats that I'm wearing now. I have Filebox in the back of my car. I'm doing this not from an office, but actually from Google, uh, because a coffee shop would be too noisy. And so we have to improvise. And I think that that's part of it, that understanding that part of being innovative is being flexible and being able to improvise, being able to work with all kinds of people. As you said, they're, they're meeting up and forming organically these groups. So I think that part of it is, is um, understanding that this is a big part of innovation, that it is outside of the box if we're talking about that, right? And that it doesn't have to be the traditional, oh, we're going to report to an office and innovate. In fact, that may not be so innovative. That the teaching and understanding these skills of, of working together, of being flexible, of being creative, that these are all extremely important and that we're seeing in the millennials and and they do and, and providing space. It could be a coffee shop, but as I said for me today, I knew the coffee shop wasn't going to work, right? And so there there does need to be something beyond that. But I think also recognizing as you were saying, there was a day where you had to have a high school diploma. Then it became you had to have a college degree. Now people are wondering, well, is that enough or do you have to have a graduate degree? Or is that, for many people, not what they need at all? The cost-benefit analysis, frankly, of that four-year degree versus being an entrepreneur and being able to start in this new creative way of business or getting a certificate or some other kind of, of training. Let me jump in on that too, because it is a really interesting question. You know, what kind of not only credentialing, but what kind of skills people need. And I think one thing, if we're thinking about policy terms, ultimately, where kind of what we're coming down to is what are the selective interventions with a limited amount of money that we could best make? And so one of the, so starting with Sherry's point about where how a lot of particularly kids from minority, less educated, less privileged backgrounds are probably getting their first digital purchase via cell phones, via game systems, things like that. So one of the things we're observing is a pattern, and I'm looking at both Craig's work and some of the stuff that we've been doing with River City and, uh, and other places. If we're not careful, there's going to be an assimilation of a lot of minority youth, particularly boys, into a, a kind of a play-only digital world where they're gaming, they're doing a lot of stuff. They may even be playing things like Minecraft, frequently they are, which could be an avenue up to learn how to program. It could be a, a thing to learn a lot of good digital skills, but it doesn't tend to happen without some kind of at least light intervention. So, you know, for instance, take what Dell Foundation did almost 15 years ago, putting, putting youth-oriented centers in a lot of libraries. So those are now places that kids congregate, interact with each other, do a lot of kind of beginning to, you know, getting online, learning how to do something like Minecraft. It's probably the most common thing that kids do in those spaces now. But without some, at least, kind of light intervention, they may not look past that to say, oh yeah, this could be my way to learn how to code. This could be my way to learn how to get involved at some level in the digital economy. And so I think we're seeing a lot of those kinds of, of semi-formal spaces, like you know, spaces in libraries, begin to pull people in, but there needs to be kind of a next step of the youth librarians that were hired to help run that thing probably need a little more training now to say, how do we encourage the kids to take what they're learning with Minecraft and go something, go someplace further with that? So, you know, we already made an intervention that gives the spaces. That was terrific. We now need to sort of bring an element of, of training or encouragement in the, in, when I uh, went to parts of your network meeting a couple of weeks ago, Craig, Mimi Ito was talking about building a center and building a place where she brings experienced kids who've done gaming into programming into the kids who are playing with only Minecraft, or just playing Minecraft now to help them see how to take Minecraft and make do something more with it. So it's exactly the kind of intervention that we probably do need. And it's, because I'm just afraid that if, 
you know, some rare kids will make their way up from getting a cell phone, learning how to do th interesting things with it, and find their own scaffolding upward. But if we want to do this on a larger scale, I think we need to kind of look down into where the spaces are, but then how we can help the kids in those spaces develop further. And I, I want to add that I think I do agree that intervention is critical and that I think it gives us an opportunity with girls too now. Uh, so there's an organization here, a nonprofit, Girl Start, that's been solely focused on getting girls from a young age, you know, elementary school, involved in technology. And I think we have the opportunity here for this um, intervention, um, as you said, with the boys gaming, but also with girls now who we want to have more involved in um, technology and in engineering in these careers and for them to see this is not scary. I'm online. I'm using technology in some in all kinds of ways and um, to then take the step from that to to the intervention of well you know you can also code right this is this is not some um, mystery that's only open to certain people and so I think that there is a, a very there's a such a big opportunity here for the um, intervention with girls. So I think that we do need to focus in on um, some specific policies or recommendations uh, that, that we can make um, to intervene. Yeah, and maybe when we, when we wrap up we can, um, we can sort of think out loud about what, what some of those interventions might be from a policy perspective, education policy perspective, City development perspective, workforce development, you know, any any number of, of potential entry points into that kind of policy conversation. Um, so let me something that's, that's on my mind here, right? Is um, you know, just based on on your, your your the work that that each of you have been doing and have discussed here, and, and I've I've read a lot of this work that you've been doing, and I think it's really important work. And I'm thinking about you know research that that a, that a that a team uh, of researchers that I uh, sort of collected together that we conducted, I guess about two two years ago now. We were in a in a high school here in the Austin metropolitan area. We sort of embedded ourselves in the school for an entire year. Uh, we spent some time in the school um, during the, during the school day, after school, summer months. So we we got a pretty extensive look at at how this one school operates. It's a very large school over 2,000 students, racially and ethnically diverse. And, you know, so we've been thinking a lot about that experience, right, and what we learn by sort of seeing up close what's happening in our classrooms, what's happening in our nation's schools, how are schools responding to this sort of changing sort of tech economy, innovation economy. Um, and as, as we know, right, more technology is coming in. Schools are trying to, you know, uh, bolster up their STEM-related kinds of courses and, and literacies that they're developing. And one of the things that, that continues to strike me about what we what we discovered, and I'm thinking about the work of, of Tyler Cowen, who um, who wrote a book a couple of years ago called Average is Over. And he's an economist, I think, from George Mason. And what he what he essentially argues in that world, and, and somewhat um, I think, you know, he was being a little bit polemical, but but the idea was that he sort of sees a future in where we have sort of two classes, right? On the one side, you've got those whose, whose skills are essentially being replaced by smart technology, being uh, replaced by computers. And then on the other side, right, are those who have skills who are kind of a, a complement to smart technologies, a complement to computers. And obviously, right, in, in that equation, those whose skills are a complement to the computer, a complement a to smart technology, are better poised and positioned to take advantage of this kind of new economy uh, that we see emerging. Um, and, and obviously, right, the, that, that, the dynamics are a little bit more complex than that, but, but just for the sake of argument here, you know, one of the things that, that, that strikes me as we sort of left that school and began to analyze a lot of what we observed and the data that we collected is are certain kids really being prepared for a future uh, that, that, that adequately anticipates this kind of changing world and the kinds of skills that young people need? And are some kids not being prepared, right? And I think if we're being honest, the answer is that, that a growing number of our kids, especially kids from low-income uh, communities, lower-achieving schools, that, that they're not being prepared for this world. They're not being prepared for the age of average being over, right? This idea that a high school diploma or maybe even a four-year degree is enough uh, to, to, to make it in this world. And so I'm wondering if, in fact, that's the case, 
you know, what, what should we be saying to schools and to educators and to policymakers about how we should be rethinking learning and rethinking education? And, I, and from my perspective, you know, thinking about some of the things that you, that you have both said here about innovation, about the economy, and about education, I wonder if a key thing that we should be doing in our schools, right, is, is really not so much about teaching just skills per se, and certainly not just tech skills, because that's not enough at all, but there seems to me that there's a, a new kind of disposition that's required to really uh, not necessarily succeed in this world, right, but, to, but to, to, to find and build opportunity in this world. And, and so it's not only the degree in hand, it's not only the credentials, but it's also about a way of seeing and being in the world, right, and sort of recognizing that in this sort of future that we're talking about, which is really today, you know, you increasingly have to be able to build your own future, make your own way, invent your own career path. Uh, and I wonder to what extent, you know, how do we begin to build that into the ethos of our schools, into the kinds of policies that we're initiating? Because it seems to me, right, that that's where we're really letting our most vulnerable uh, kids down in terms of not really adequately preparing them to have that disposition to step into the world with a sense of agency that they can really exercise some degree of control and influence over the trajectory of their own lives. One, one example that I would love to scale up um, is what I see being done by River City Youth Foundation and Dove Springs because I think um, they're doing perhaps the most effective thing I see being done in the city. So we just take them as a best case in some ways. So they're working in one of the most poor, most problematic neighborhoods. So part of the deal, and this gets at something Sherry said, I mean, it's kind of hard sometimes to introduce these things from top down. This one group has been in Dove Springs for 30 years. They started as an anti-gang, youth-oriented, somewhat technology-oriented group. But about six years ago, they had sort of an aha moment that said, um, you know, it's not enough to work with the youth. We have to get their parents involved. And I think part of the best practice that we need right now is helping first-generation Latino parents in particular, but other disadvantaged, low-income parents in, in general, begin to realize how fast the workplace is changing, how what the demands on their kids are going to be, and get them actively on the side of helping their kids adapt. So that's something River City does, is they begin to, they spend probably two-thirds of their time explaining to first-generation Latino parents how the workplace has changed, how the educational requirements have changed, and what they have to do in order to help their kids get ahead. So coming back to that question of relevance, you know, probably two-thirds of their classroom time is demonstrating the relevance, and then about a third is using technology. So your first email is to your kid's teacher. Your first use of the Internet is AISD Parent Cloud. Your third use is using Google to help explore ideas with your kids. And so that really kind of brings in a package on the parental side. And then with the kids, they literally have the Build Your Own Future Club, you know, exactly addressing the thing you're talking about. Because from what they tell me, 90% of the kids they work with don't have a goal before they start. Again, you know, demonstrating the relevance of some kind of fairly low-key and friendly intervention. And so their intervention with the kids is to get them starting to think about uh, putting fun together with goals. You know, the technology is fun, it's cool, but let's use the technology to help you explore what your goals might be and what education and other skills might be required for that. And that seems to be a very successful package. So I just kind of wanted to lay that out as a kind of best practice that we might think from, something that brings the generations together, because I think it's hard to focus on one or the other. I noticed in the several presentations your group has made, Craig, a lot of the times the kids are acting in isolation. They don't know, even with good after-school programs, how to really bridge that into the larger community. They don't have the social capital, the networks, their parents aren't really on board. The most successful example that Andres talked about, for instance, was a family that was in the way of making its way into the middle class. And so I think we need to sort of do community-based interventions that target both parents and kids, and with a heavy emphasis on, on relevance and contextualization. I mean, it's in, I think the background information is almost more important than the technology at this point. And, and I would add to that that for um, there, there is a huge intergenerational component. And for some of these kids, it's not their parents, it's their grandparents, right, who are most involved in their lives. And for a lot of these folks um, who, who may have been immigrants, they have a certain um, concern about interacting with the schools and even that it's not their place, that it's a, they, 
grew up in a top-down approach. You don't interact with the schools. You don't ask for things, right? And so whether it's the parents or the grandparents, making sure they have the skill set to interact with the schools and to understand um, the technology. And then um, moving beyond that, it is about relevance. It either has to be useful in your daily life or at least regularly from some time. And I think um, you do need to integrate the schools with the family, with the after school and community programs, with the community engagements, with the grassroots, not just uh, the top down. That is very important. But I also get back to something that, that schools haven't necessarily been great at teaching and maybe sometimes have squashed, and that is that we're not rooted in place anymore. And for these students to understand that, that it's not just not rooted in the neighborhood, that they can be communicating with people all over the world, right? And that could be their future in a, in a business in today's world. And um, so I think that, that that is extremely important for them. And again, for teaching these skills that are not just technology skills, but societal skills. When I talked about the flexibility and being able to work with different types of people and teams and being able to, to think uh, creatively. And as I said, sometimes schools are on the other end of that. So I think we need to, to get that into the curriculums. We need the intergenerational component, the public engagement component, and the community um, all involved. And clearly the relevance either in their daily lives or, at, or seeing that it will be um, at some point at how. Yeah, these are great, and I really like this idea of um, this, this sort of intergenerational dynamic or components. And you know, for all of the sort of important institutions that we that we've mentioned today, right? You know, the family clearly, right? You know, continues to be an absolutely uh, central one. And 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 that was that came up, you know, last week um, a bit more extensively uh, with Sonia Livingstone from the London School of Economics last week in one of these webinars that we did uh, as a part of the series. Um, so you both have been uh, amazing, as I knew you would be. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I thought we might end um, on, a, on a kind of forward-thinking note here, and, and, and I'd like to ask each of you uh, this question. So if you were king or queen for a day, and, um, and you were able to, to see or make uh, one intervention, right, uh, employ one intervention that might help to sort of, you know, uh, direct us towards this more equitable uh, kind of world of opportunity, uh, in this sort of changing world of innovation, um, you know, what what might that intervention be? What might that, that that policy shift or policy tweak be that you think might help you know steer us toward a path of creating a more equitable and sustainable future? Well, if I can break the rules and ask for two, here's my two. Okay. One would be to put somebody like the lady who works in the oh in the I'm trying to remember the it's the library at the back of um, 12th and 11th Street, right off, right off airport, the Willie Mae Kirk Library. They have a 20 or 30 hour person, black woman, good skills, good communication skills, who can help all those people in that neighborhood solve their crises. And I would put somebody like her in every library in the country. So that would be one. The other would probably be to take something like the Dove Springs, Mendez, River City partnership and uh, build that into every junior high across the country to have somebody who's helping engage both parents and kids in, in, in understanding the relevance of education, understanding what education kids need, and kind of building a scaffolding between play and a more imaginative set of goals. That would be my two. Okay. And I'm going to go back to actually the the more holistic approach that I talked about, and that is if, if we want more equity and equitable access, I think that we have to be much more intentional in our communities and the communities that we're creating and how we are locating and co-locating the physical space and combining that with um, the needs for equity and new economy. And so co-locating um, the, the housing, and with the housing, if you don't have access and getting in, something like Austin Freenet is doing, and co-locating that with the clinics and what we call all of the wraparound um, services, all available. Now, these are all great, and and I'll 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 toss one one in myself in terms of um, if 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 I were king for a day. Um, you know, I'm noticing. I've just noticed within the last couple of years or so here at the University of Texas at Austin. 
you know, the, that more and more departments are creating uh, these so-called maker spaces. Mm -hmm. um, and these are spaces, right, that, um, that are really designed to be spaces of what I would call open innovation, where there's, there's no determined sort of set of outcomes in terms of who participates and what they do. Uh, you know, there's, there's not really much of a curriculum. It's really just a space for young people to come and to connect and meet other young people with other kinds of expertise and knowledge and skills, work in a kind of collaborative setting, maybe work with uh, you know, instructors or mentors who can help take an idea to, to, to another stage of development. But it's really a, a, a place for, for, for experimenting, for exchanging ideas, uh, for being exposed to new ideas, being exposed to new forms of expertise, really kind of growing both human and social capital. And, and if I were king for a day, you know, I would, I would say, why can't we sort of create those kinds of spaces uh, in, our, in our communities, right? Um, and because they exist, right, in our universities, they exist in the more elite uh, kinds of uh, centers and spaces of innovation and opportunity. But, but in the places, right, where people who may have aspirations to launch, create, or build something or make something, you know, they really do struggle, right, to find those places to connect to fail, to explore new ideas, to innovate in a kind of open, open way, you know, what if we were able to create those kinds of spaces and make them available to, to, to more diverse people? Um, and, and might it be uh, a sort of a catalyst, if you will, for really inspiring uh, and launching whole new kinds of innovation ecosystems, whole new kinds of communities of innovators, uh, and it could be really a wonderful thing to, uh, to, to see. So. Um, so a lot to chew on here. Uh, thank you both so much for, um, for joining us here. And uh, again, thank you to Mark Strama for Google Fiber uh, for coming in uh, and, uh, and helping us out uh, as one of his colleagues uh, ran into an unfortunate uh, event and could be here. Um, so let me wrap this up. Uh, this is uh, the, the, the fourth uh, of a series of webinars that we've done this October uh, around uh, doing innovation and empowering young people for tomorrow's world. We'll be um, uh, archiving a, a lot of this information uh, on Connected Learning TV. Uh, please feel free uh, to the audience here uh, to keep the energy going on Twitter using the hashtag, hashtag Connected Learning. There will also be a full video recording of this webinar available immediately on www.connectedlearning.tv with other curated content on the way. If you found this conversation helpful, please share it with your networks. And if you'd like to know more about upcoming webinars from Connected Learning TV in 2015, please visit www.connectedlearning.tv and sign up for the email newsletter. Uh, thanks again, Sherry. Thanks again, Joe. Thanks again, Mark, um, for your participation. Uh, check out doinginnovation.org if you get a chance. Uh, and um, we'll see you next Thursday. Uh, or, I'm sorry, we'll see you next Thursday uh, for the uh, next webinar, uh, which will um, be posted. Uh, here in the next uh, few days or so. Thank you very much and have a nice day. Thank you, Craig. Thank you, everyone.